John 14. John 13, 38. This is one of those places I always thought, why'd they put the chapter division right there? Because John 13, 38, Jesus didn't tell Peter that before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And then a week later, <laughs> come back, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. It was, this is all going on in the upper room. This is one conversation with the chapter 14 stuck between it here. But it was, uh, he just told, you know, Peter's bragged, you know, Lord, I'll die for you. And the Lord says, well, you, is, uh, before morning, you're going to deny me three times. So it was the wind taken out of Peter's sails. And Jesus comforted him with these words. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I guess I had John 14 on my mind this morning. I was watching the news. And the, in fact, it's 700 Club news I was watching. And the, you think about everything going on in the world right now. You know, there's two major wars going on in the world. And the superpowers of the world are in the shadows lining up behind each side, you know. But uh, it also came, and the guy reading this uh, on the 700 Club, I forgot that one's name, the, the black guy that does, does the news, is kind of like, he's grinning when he says this, and I'm thinking, you don't even realize what you just said, you know. He's talking about how China has 500 missiles with nuclear capability right now, 500 of them. And then he just went on to the next story and smiling, and I'm thinking, you know, 500 there's 50 states. That's 10 nukes per state. <laughs> and then I thought there's what, five major cities in Tennessee. Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville. It'd just be four. <laughs> Wouldn't it? I missed something. So at least six for the Clevelands and Bristols and <laughs> Kingstons. I, I mean, we could be just the end. But then all of a sudden I thought, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. <laughs> believe also in me. Because in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, Jesus said, I would have told you. And I, I go to prepare a place for you. So if, if, this, if this world becomes uninhabitable, guess what? I've got a place, don't you? <laughs> There's a place for me. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again. And receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. A lot of great things we can say about heaven, but the number one thing is Jesus is there. And he'll be with us. And we'll be with him. And Jesus says, and, and whither I, where I'm going and the way you know. Y'all know? I hope so. We got 27 books called the New Testament to tell us all about it, but... Uh, we, we kind of got a leg up on, on old Thomas here. Thomas didn't know. Thomas been spending three and a half years at his feet. So Thomas chimes in, where do you go, you know? And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know. I'm paraphrasing. You want the King James? We know not. But that just means we don't know. <laughs> we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? <laughs> As I said, we've got 27 books of the New Testament. I know the way to get there is through the cross of Christ. That hadn't occurred yet, but it's getting within just a few days right here. And Jesus says, says to Thomas, I'm kind of glad Thomas asked the question. If he hadn't, we wouldn't have got, got these beautiful answer of Jesus. How do we know the way, Lord? And Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the way. I'm the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way to heaven but through Jesus Christ. That's not according to me, that's according to Jesus and me. If you'd known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, he's talking to Philip now, but it's for all of us. And from henceforth, you know him. And Philip he says, you've seen him. You've seen him. You've seen the father. And, and Philip says, uh, verse 8, Lord, show us the father and it suffices. Or we'll be satisfied. Show him, show the Father to us. 
And Jesus says, uh, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me? Philip, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Boy, that's a deity statement, ain't it? If you've seen me, he said, you've seen the Father. And, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? And then Jesus goes on and says, Believest thou not that, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Now, I would add to that too. Jesus said, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. And I'd say, and I'm in Christ. By grace through faith, right? Jesus in the Father, the Father's in Christ, and I'm in Christ. So we're all rolled up in God. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the works. The, believe me that I, meant that I am in the Father, verse 11, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. It's like he's making two points there. Believe me for the word's sake, because the words that I've shared with you is the words of God. Or believe me for the work's sake, the things that you've seen, the, the evidence is that the word is true. Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I'm going to the Father. He said, how in the world does the church do greater works? The only way I can explain that is the church don't do greater works in quality, but the church does greater works in quantity. Jesus was in one place and one time doing miracles. His disciples were in the Middle East doing miracles. But the church is... His ultimate goal was to do miracles in the name of Jesus worldwide. And, you know, there's a lot of people today that they, they don't believe in God because then they make a mockery of the church because they don't see. And, 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 uh, and they, there's some of that's just rebellion and people don't want to let go of their sin. But some of it the church has caused because a lot of times people who are looking for an excuse not to be not to follow Christ. They'll, they'll look to the church and they'll say, I don't see any point in the church. It's just to get together the place where people are fussing and fighting and they treat each other better down at the bar. And there's some truth to that sometimes, ain't there? But if the church is being the church, the church is doing a lot of good in the name of Jesus in the world too. The church should never exist just for itself. The church should exist to carry the mission of Jesus out into the world. By the way, I've got our business reports for the end of the service here to give out tonight on the last Wednesday night. And I counted them a while ago, and I believe uh, we, we met our first five mission goals, $1,000 to each one of these missions. Then we've done two churches' choice, $1,000 to each one of them, we just sent the, the check this week to the, put in the mailbox a while ago, Shriners Children's Hospital. <laughs> and tonight it's time to vote for another church's choice, which will be our eighth mission goal this week that, that, that we'll be working on. Uh, just those bullet points, not to mention the other things that we're doing. Greater works than these he'll do, because I'm going to the Father. Verse 13, and whatsoever you'll ask in my name, that will I do. That's hard for us to receive, ain't it? Whatever you'll ask in my name, Jesus said, I'll do it. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Well, I don't know. I prayed for something. He didn't do it. <laughs> Has he done everything you've asked him to do? So there's got to be some stipulation to this, right? <laughs> I always think, first of all, you're God and I'm not. You know best, right? If he did everything I told him to do, it'd kind of be backwards, <laughs> right? But sometimes we get to think God's our servant. He's supposed to do what we tell him to do, right? It's the other way around. 
If God did everything that every one of us told us to do, we'd have the world in a big mess, wouldn't we? <laughs> Can, if it's your will, Lord, yeah. That, Jesus prayed that way, didn't he? <laughs> he didn't do everything Jesus asked him to do, right? If there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And, and the situation didn't change. Jesus still had to go to the cross, right? That was God's will. So yeah, yeah that's one point. It's got to be God's will. And another thing I've thought too, I think, uh, can you imagine the, the suffering that we would cause, not because we want people to suffer, but we would never turn our loved ones loose. <laughs> We'd prolong that suffering as long as we could, couldn't we? Praying for them to live. It's good to pray for them to live, you know, if it be, but, you know, if God, if God answered every prayer, think how, how people would have suffered. And, and we're really just keeping them out of heaven anyway, right? <laughs> So, but, but Jesus, uh, maybe there's other, there's other qualifications to this. So James said one, James told the people in the first century around him, the church, he said, you ask and you ask amiss. <laughs> you can ask things wrongly. You ask and you ask amiss because you're, cons to, King James is kind of difficult there, to consume it upon your own lust. In other words, uh, that's the Janice Joplin prayer. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz, right? <laughs> and a color TV. Remember that song? <laughs> that had nothing to do with, with I mean, if, if, a, if a missionary was praying that I need a bicycle, that would be something for the kingdom of God. So I can get around to the villages to share Christ. We've provided bicycles to missionaries here before, haven't we? But if I'm just praying for a Mercedes Benz or a nice Schwinn's, or something else. And it don't have nothing to, that's I think what James is talking about. You ask and you ask amiss to consume it upon your own lust. But I think I think if we if we can get our heart right and our mind right and our life right to tap into the power of God and we're asking something for the benefit of the kingdom of God, I believe God gives us a blank check on that. And I think that's what Jesus has said here. Whatever you ask in my name, for the kingdom's sake, if I can say that, that will I do. Because why? That'll bring glory to God. That'll glorify the Father and the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. So you can boldly go before the throne of grace. If you don't get your answer, there ain't nothing wrong with God. There ain't nothing wrong with you. You might ask wrong, just might have been God's will, but you can still ask, right? To pray to you the best of your ability. And, 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 and that's a good filter right there if, if, when you're asking God for something. Is this going to be beneficial to God's kingdom? Because that's the most important thing. Verse 15 might not be so far separated from it as my Bible does here and puts a a heading between verse 14 and 15, I'd connect it together. Once again, Jesus didn't stop and start a different story. This is one dialogue, monologue really here. If you love me, keep my commandments. Well, we can say a couple things about that. That's a, You can correlate how much you love God with how much you're being obedient to God. You're not going to be rebellious to somebody you love, are you? You're going to be, the more you're... But, in the context of what Jesus is saying here, maybe this has had has something to do with the power of prayer too. If you want God to bless your prayer life, then live for Him. Nobody's perfect, but there's a difference in messing up and confessing and getting right with God and, and just living in sin, willful disobedience. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter, capital C, Holy Spirit, that he'll abide with you forever. Remember Jesus had said elsewhere in the other gospel, said, said the comforter can't come until he goes away. When Jesus, After Jesus ascends, 10 days in the prayer meeting in the upper room, then the comforter and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells with the apostles and dwells with every believer. What's he like? He's Jesus in the spirit form. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Even the spirit of truth, that's the comforter, whom the world can't receive. But you're not of the world, little children, John said. You're, you're, of, you're in a different world. You're, you're from the kingdom of God. The world can't receive him, though, because it sees him not. Neither knows him. 
That's the difference. If you know God through Christ, he gives you the Holy Spirit to dwell with you. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he'll be in you. I'll not leave you comfortless. Jesus is going away, but I'll not leave you comfortless. I will come to you in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yet a little while, just a little while now, and the world sees me no more. But you see me, and because I live, you'll live also. I think Jesus is looking post-cross now, the other side of the tomb. Because I live, you'll, because of the resurrection, you'll live also. At that day, you shall know that I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I in you. There it is, all rolled up in God. I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. He that hath my commandments, I got them, don't you? I can turn to them right here now. What is that, Exodus 12, I think, 10 commandments? I got them. That ain't enough, though, is it? And keeps them. This reminds me of what we've been studying in Samuel on Sunday night. Remember the Israelites were going to go in, they were going to fight with the Philistines, and they went to fight with the Philistines, and they got their tails kicked. Thousands of them died. And somebody says, well, we need to go get the Ark of the Covenant down there at Shiloh and bring it back. Says, uh, uh, God, uh, bring that Ark of the Covenant and, and, and we'll be blessed. Then. And, and they got the Ark back, but the Ark represented something. <laughs> the presence of God with his people, but they were looking at it as just a superstitious super of an object. It's like a good luck charm to them. And they got their tails kicked again. Thousands of them died. And the Philistines captured the ark. They took it down to Gaza. This is Samuel. Sounds like the evening news, right? Took it down to Gaza. <laughs> and God started plaguing them. The Philistines had sent it to another city and that God would plague them. If you don't have a sense of humor, you read it and can say, God plagued them with hemorrhoids. <laughs> Millions of them. <laughs> and the leaders would get together and say, what are we going to do? Send it down to the other. Send it to Gath. <laughs> and they sent it to three or four cities, and one of them finally heard about it and said, don't send that thing down to us. <laughs> but people still look at vampire movies. Vampire can't stand the cross, <laughs> right? You might believe in this one. I've heard it. I mean, if it helps you, good. But I'm telling you, it's, it's a superstition. I've heard, I've heard people tell this for my whole life. If you have bad dreams, what do you do in Appalachia? Put the Bible under your pillow and sleep, right? It's supposed to keep you from having bad dreams. It's almost the same as the Philistines. If we get that Ark of the Covenant, we're all right, you know? <laughs> the power is... Uh, Doyle, you say, Brother Doyle, you say this. I'm a crack it. You know, he said, uh, says, uh, this book right here, this one ain't, this one's a hardback book, but uh, if you got a good one, said it ain't nothing. It's a, if you got a leather one with the rice paper, and he, he said, he said, apart from faith, said all it is is dead cows, dead octopuses, and some dead rice paper. <laughs> but by faith, it's the living word of God. The cross is the same way. There's not any power just wearing a cross around your neck. You see some of the most ungodly people you ever see on TV running around the cross around their neck, right? There's no power in just the object. The power is in what it stands for. Whether it's the Bible or the cross or the Ark of the Covenant. So, actually there was some power in that Ark of the Covenant when the enemy opened it up, wasn't it? But, but not for good for them. It, it killed them, 70,000 of them. Where did I get to? <laughs> oh, verse 21. I was trying to think, how did I get on this? It, it's because just putting the Ten Commandments on the wall, we've got some hanging right back there. Well, that's good to remind us of the Ten Commandments, right? But the point is, Jesus says, they're not just for reading and admiring, they're for living. <laughs> he that has my commandments, verse 21, and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I love him and will reveal, manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, remember this written years later by John, after the fact, so he always points out the other. There's a good Judas and a bad Judas of the disciples, right? 
So the good Judas is always known in the, by the gospel writers as Judas, not Iscariot. So Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, because that one's gone already. Remember, he jumped up and ran out earlier after he dipped in the sop. He's gone to get the enemy to bring them back and arrest Jesus. So the good Judas is still there. Lord, how is it that you'll manifest yourself unto us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, verse 23, If a man loves me, he'll keep my words. It's good to own the Bible. <laughs> but live the Bible is even better. Open it up and read it and let it become part of you. Keep his words. And, and my Father will love him and he'll come unto, the, unto him and we'll make our abode with him. We'll, if, if they'll live for me, we, we can live with them. There's an old saying, there's some truth in it, I guess, said... Uh, God don't live in a dirty house. Know you not that your body is the temple of God. Live for it. He that loves me not, just to put it on the other side of the coin, if you don't love Jesus, he says, they'll not keep my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but that's the word of God, the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. Just a little bit longer. It's the last night before the cross but the comforter and just in case there's any confusion about who the comforter is with a capital C here which is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit same word in the Greek pneuma Holy Spirit Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name and if the Holy Ghost comes in the name of Jesus that means only Christians get the Holy Ghost amen <laughs> And here's some things that the Holy Ghost will do, among other things. He's been said to do a whole lot of things, but here's some that Jesus says he'll do. He'll teach you. He'll teach you all things. He'll, he'll teach you, help you to understand the Bible. He'll, he'll help you to understand the, the truth from the air. That's from, from the reading the Bible under the, the conviction and the power of the Holy Ghost. One of the clear things that just as a Christian, you know this is true. If somebody's saying something, you can just sit there and you think, that's honoring to Christ. Then you know right off that's probably true, ain't it? But if somebody says something, it seems like it's dishonoring to Christ, and you're kind of like, I don't know about that. He, he'll teach you <laughs> all things. And, and here's something else he'll do, and this is important not only for us, but it was really important to this original group in the upper room. The Holy Ghost will bring things to your remembrance that I've said unto you. He helps us to memorize the Word of God, but it was really important for these guys because we're reading the words of one of them that he wrote later now, right? It was Holy Ghost inspired when he wrote this down. The Bible, it's our Bible. They're the ones that are going to write it later. And, and, and they're not on their own because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's Holy Ghost. It's God-breathed. And he'll bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said unto you. Peace I live unto you. Now, we Christians understand that. We're talking about inner peace here. I don't think there's ever been a time in this world since the fall that there's been worldwide peace. There's always been fussing and fighting and killing and wars and nothing new about that. But Jesus clears that up right here. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. His kind of peace is one that causes your heart not to be troubled or afraid. Neither let it be afraid. You've heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father. Now, we're still that way, too. We're human beings, right? We don't want to let anybody go to heaven that we love, right? But the Lord says, if you could see it through the eyes of faith, if you could see things the way God sees it, that'd be a day of rejoicing more than a day of mourning. I thought of this. I think God revealed this to me many years ago. I'd go pick up my daughter after junior high up there in Freeze, Virginia, and I'd sit there in that line... And get there early, sit there, and a little while you hear that bell ring. And you, you count about three seconds, and them doors will poof, 
boom, come out of that school, kids running out across the lawn everywhere, you know. And they're thrilled to death as you know, the, getting out of there and going home. <laughs> and I sitting there one day looking at that, and I thought, I bet you that's what it's like in heaven. When people are coming to heaven, you're on that side of it, you know. And you're seeing them come in, everybody's happy, and they're coming home. But on the inside, you know, the school's empty and sad. It's dark, you know. Because we're looking at it from this side instead of looking at it from the other side when they're coming to us. And that's what Jesus said. I'm going to my father. He said, if you could understand that, you'd rejoice. <laughs> my father is, is greater than I in authority. Not pecking order, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These three are one. And now I've told you before it come to pass, then when it is come to pass, and when Jesus or anybody in the Bible tells you something before it comes to pass, that's called prophecy, right? So Jesus had a lot of prophecy here that's going to come to pass just in the next few hours. When, when it is come to pass that you might believe, he told us it'd be that way, then when we see it happen here a little bit later, we remember and it strengthens our faith. Hereafter I'll not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes. Now who's coming back with the enemy? Going to betray, he done made a deal with them. That you see the one that I, I kiss. I'll greet him with a, with a kiss. And, and what did the Bible say about him your chapter or two ago? Satan entered into him. So the prince of this world is the devil, but right now he's possessing Judas, and he's coming. But he, Jesus said this about the devil, though. He's got nothing in me. I wish we could say that. <laughs> if he didn't have something in us, we'd never be tempted to sin. A magnet won't pick up gold. Jesus was like pure gold. We're like metal. And the magnet's sin. And that attraction is temptation. And the reason we're tempted to it is because we were born sinners, we were conceived in sin, and there's a temptation there. He's got something on us, we've got to fight against it. But Jesus said, he's got nothing in me. <laughs> but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Now how's the world going to know Jesus loves the Father? Because I'm going to do what he said to do, right? How's the world going to know that, th that you're a Christian, that you love Jesus? Because you're going to do what he said to do. And what he, specifically is Jesus about to do that's a command of the Father? He's going to get up and head toward the cross. Not my will, but nevertheless thy will. Arise and let us go hence. And I think that's where they get up and leave the upper room. In the next few chapters they're walking through the streets of Jerusalem as Jesus teaches. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the word of God as we close tonight. Lord, we make that our prayer that we will arise and go hence in the name of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.